architecture, I believe, should be hyper-objective, a response to problems of immense scale through an aesthetic approach of immense scale. It is through this lens that we can transform our understanding of sustainability. Now, whether you realize it or not, you've all been in LEED certified buildings, LEED Platinum, LEED Gold. This building that we're all in right now is actually a wonderful LEED Silver building. This is the standard by which most people in America measure whether a building is sustainable or not. Now, we've all seen a lot of these in recent years as well, tiny houses on wheels, and this has been an attempt at a more sustainable lifestyle. I actually built this tiny house uh, after completing my bachelor's degree in interior design, and I've lived in it here in Austin ever since the following fall. Now, while it's been incredibly rewarding getting to live in a space that I designed at an early stage of my career, that's a privilege that not a lot of young architects and designers get, I've learned as much from the shortcomings and the failures of it as I have anything I did particularly well. Now, certainly there are things that I would have designed differently in this house, but I've learned a lot about tiny houses in general, of minimalism, and of micro-living as a lifestyle. You see, less isn't more, as a lot of modernists in the mid-20th century had led us to believe. For me, I believe that more is more. We can move beyond the, the modernist ideal of less is more and redefine our sustainability. If we're not creating more energy than we use, we will forever be behind the eight ball. All the tiny houses in the world, all the micro apartments in New York and San Francisco at 200 square feet, these are good steps in the right direction, but we still may be behind the eight ball. Timothy Morton, an ecological philosopher who studied uh, climate change in great detail, has coined the term hyperobjects to describe things like global warming, which are of such uh, great uh, time and vast scale that humans can't really begin to wrap our brains around them. For many of us, when we think about global warming, we think about the way that it will affect our kids or our grandkids, but it's really tough to internalize or, or sympathize with much beyond that. Even though this problem of global warming very well could last several hundreds of years, if not longer. For Morton, hyperobjects, while they may be hundreds or thousands of years in scale, they are also things which are ever-present and imminent in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, a great example of this is bottled water. I was just drinking bottled water in the green room before this speech. I need water to survive, and sometimes it comes out of plastic bottles. Now, as someone who cares about sustainability, we all know we should feel guilty about that. We shouldn't be drinking water out of plastic bottles. So in order to feel better, better about myself and not feel guilty about this, when I get done with it, I make sure it at least goes in the green recycling bin instead of the trash. Now, this is a silly example, but it is global warming in its thousands of years of scale. But sticking its nose in the face of the minutia of your day-to-day -day life and disrupting the way that you interface with the world. Hyperobjects like global warming are inhuman. They're going to be around a lot longer than we are, and until we truly grasp their scale and their weight, we'll never be able to fully and holistically tackle the problems that they present us. In order to combat these hyper-objective crises, everything, including architecture, has to operate at that same level. Buildings can today go beyond uh, addressing the, in, the environmental impact of their energy usage while simultaneously shifting our perspective allowing us to envision far-off futures and inviting us to question our place within the world in order to come to a greater understanding of it. The inhuman immensity of these hyperobjects is actually a means of making spaces which are more human. That is, by contrast, by experiencing something which is totally foreign, we can actually come to a greater understanding of what it means to be in the world. Mark Foster Gage, an architect and an associate dean at Yale, has said that architecture should serve as an ethical reminder of the things which are greater than us, and by doing so, make our differences seem much smaller. Now, it may not be that architecture should give us an answer that we all agree upon, but instead can instill within us a desire to look deeper, to ask questions of our surroundings and the world around us, and come to conclusions and answers and the truth on our own terms. 
If we want to move the needle on climate change, the discipline as a whole has an opportunity to reassess our values. The hyper-object of global warming asks that we move beyond the status quo of sustainability. And what that provides us an opportunity to do is also reassess the way that sustainability appears and what it quite literally stands for. Can we go beyond uh, designing for a given program or tenant brief that may only last the first 20 years or so of a building's life? Form, I would argue, doesn't follow function anymore as an inhuman future demands that we have to think beyond the first life of the building. Instead, creating an architecture which is valid and meaningful and challenges us aesthetically 100 years or more from now? The project that you're beginning to see is simply one attempt that I've begun to make at, at understanding what this future of inhuman, beyond sustainable, hyper-objective architecture could possibly look like. Uh, the original project was for a new headquarters for Austin Energy Green Building uh, at the Mueller Development on a site across from Alamo Draft House. The original program was to create new office space, uh, to create tech labs, a small auditorium, and gallery space for public exhibitions. The project that you're seeing here, however, while meeting those space and square footage requirements, is much more speculative. It's not meant to be built tomorrow. It's asking the question, how can the future of architecture be made? And what can it feel like? How can buildings present themselves to us? Not only did I determine that for an entity like Austin Energy, yes, the building needs to be sustainable. It has to create more energy than it uses, but it could also be dynamic and vast and perhaps even a little bit confusing. I mean, what do you do with this? Your, build, your brain may not recognize that this is even a building, and if that's the case, that's actually exactly the point. How do buildings present themselves to us? We get an idea that there's some kind of complex structure happening inside. It's covered with this sort of amorphous bubble, which is being pushed and pulled while simultaneously obscuring the structure. It's really weird. It's supposed to be. And the, the building is seemingly at odds with its context at Mueller, not as any kind of uh, a, a critical statement of the buildings around it, but simply to ask the question, what can the future be? and how could it look and feel? We get a sense, though, that even though this thing is very complex, it's actually not a pipe dream. This is actually a very realistic structure, which is based on standard, discrete, uh, readily available dimensional lumber that we have right now. As we move to the interior and see a detail of, of the structure, we, we get a sense now of may, maybe a better sense of what is happening. The interior structure of this building is made of, uh, of composite um, timber products. And the structure, while it seemed to be shooting out at random, uh, it's actually defined by four angles. You see the horizontals and the verticals, and then everything else is defined by two distinct diagonals. Now, that lends uh, lateral stability to the structure as a whole, which is important for the building to stand. But it also standardizes the angles of joinery. And for an intricate, complex, highly differentiated system like this, that actually makes the construction of this building feasible. We've seen in the last five years or so a, a lot of adoption of mass timber products. Larry was talking about the, the vast history of, of timber and architecture, which has always been a wonderful material to build with. We've seen some awesome advances in recent years on things like glue lamb and cross laminated timber. And without getting too technical, basically what these materials are, if you're, if you're not familiar with the, the terminology, is uh, they're basically large-scale building products, which are made of wood scraps and smaller pieces, uh, which allow us to recycle old, old material and to harvest timber from shorter growth trees, younger trees, which encourages more sustainable forestry practices. Wood is also an inherent carbon sink, that is, over its life cycle, uh, uh, trees obviously absorb carbon dioxide, and they hold that carbon dioxide within themselves, and they don't release that back into the atmosphere until eventually they decay. Thereby, they, they neutralize, when they're used in building applications, they neutralize their carbon footprint. Now, we in the building industry should absolutely be advocating for their adoption in more projects as we move forward. They operate, one of the, their advantages is that they operate in similar fashion to concrete and steel construction, which has made the building industry able to easily adopt and adapt to them. But what it hasn't truly answered is a changing aesthetic that could be associated with 
timber construction and a new wave of environmentalism and sustainability. And while I've been using this term aesthetic, which may sound a little bit superficial and sort of Instagram blogger to you, aesthetic is actually a philosophical concept. It dates all the way back to Plato. Think of aesthetics as more than just our understanding of beauty, but as the buffer or the zone through which you and I interpret the world and interpret reality around us. In that sense, my view of you, the audience right now, your view of me, is an aesthetic phenomenon. Aesthetics is what is telling me that there is, in fact, a group of people sitting here in front of me right now, and I'm not otherwise at home in the shower and shouldn't sing Jonas Brothers at the top of my lungs. It'd be very embarrassing. It would be embarrassing for all of us. The future, this is the realm through which architecture always and most powerfully works. It is aesthetic and it is indirect as opposed to a more direct educational or didactic version. Architecture and all of our disciplines have an opportunity uh, to take steps now to fight global warming and do what we can. But what our aesthetics have to say matters significantly. The future is inviting us into something, and, and what the future looks like is still a question. And for you, this may not be it, and that's totally okay. That's not the problem. The, the question is, what is the future inviting us into, and what will our response be to it? Thank you.